In 1938, Satchel Paige was struggling with his new life without baseball after his arm injury. He had inquired about possible coaching and managerial jobs around the Negro League, but no one would take a chance on him, even for his name. That was until J.L. Wilkerson finally took a gamble on Paige, and it turned out to earn him a fortune. Wilkerson signed him to the Kansas City traveling team and limited his appearances while Paige's arm gradually recovered and he started striking out hitters with his old frequency and soon the traveling team was out earning the Kansas City Monarchs. Wilkerson wanted to promote Page to the Monarchs, but he was still banned from the Negro Leagues. But after Page pitched in the Puerto Rican League and won the championship in 1940, his services suddenly became a hot issue. Abe and Afa Manley mailed Page the Newark Eagle contract, believing that they still owned him after their deal with with the Crawfords fell through, but Paige wanted Afa Manley to be part of the contract. When Afa told Paige that she would have none of that proposal, Paige went back to his Paige All-Star team pending his elevation to the Kansas City Monarchs. This latest walkout by Paige had the Negro Leagues in crisis, and by 1940, two dozen players had defected to the Negro Leagues. During the league meetings in June of 1940, the topic of discussion was the page problem. Welcome to One Mike. I'm your host, Country Boy, and as you may have heard, this is the fourth and final episode about the Negro Leagues, specifically about baseball integration and Jackie Robinson and the downturn in the Negro Leagues. If you like this, if you love this, please consider donating to our Patreon page. Visit us at onemikehistory.com and review us on Apple Podcasts. Give us five stars. Without further ado, let's get started. Before the league meetings, the Manleys got the New York Cuban Stars and the New York Black Yankees to agree that if the New York Eagles withdrew from the Negro Leagues over the ownership of Page, they would also. But it wouldn't come to that. After two days of discussion, the Manleys realized that they would not be able to get Page and look for other ways to benefit themselves. So they raided the Toledo Crawfords of two players pointing out that if it was good for J.L. Wilkerson, it was also good for them. After the two league presidents ruled that they couldn't make Page play for the Newark Giants and the two players had to go back to the Toledo Crawfords, but the Mantleys held their ground and the league agreed to the extortion and the cracks of the Negro National League were laid bare. Meanwhile, in late 1940, Wilkerson believed it was time for Page to don a Monarchs uniform. Page's first start drew over 10,000 fans against the American Giants, fearing that the Negro League was eroding away way, the Mantleys asked for Tom Wilson to be removed as league president. Afa felt that the president of the league should be a non-owner and she wanted Dr. Cillian P. Powell, publisher of the Black Amsterdam News. But Wilson was not Afa's real target. Her actual target was Ed Gottlieb. She had complained about Wilson's approval of an agreement for Gottlieb to collect 10% of the games at Yankee Stadium as a private booking agent. The complaint touched a nerve within the league because a called Cumberland Posey and Uncle Tom, but in a 3-3 vote, Wilson kept his job at presidency, but Cumberland Posey was considerably embarrassed. Posey would take his issue to the news, insisting that white booking agents wasn't an issue till Afa made it an issue. These attempts to diminish Afa Manley and her views proved to be unsuccessful because the black press was already partial to her and that her sex was advantageous to the newspaper sales. The strange thing about this is that Ed Godliff and Afa Manley privately thought that white booking agents did make some sense. Godliff used his influence to cut the fee that Negro League teams paid to Yankee Stadium to rent from $1,300 to $1,000, saving the league almost $10,000 in 1939. Afa was more concerned with the racial symbolism rather than capitalism at that particular time. 
time. By the 40s, the East-West game had become a stormy issue. Playing the game was no longer considered its own reward. In the weeks before the 1940 game, it became clear that owners were not going to pay a cent above incidental expenses. Players grumbling led to owners attempting to modify them by giving them each a gold Elgin wristwatch. This did nothing to deal with the issue, and in 1941, when Page came back to the East-West game, after a five-year absence, the West squad would incense when they found out that Page was getting a cut of the gate. So in days before the game, they threatened to boycott the contest unless they were paid in cash. Unable to justify not doing so, they paid each player $50 for their role in the All-Star game. Page was billed as a starter in the 1941 East-West game, but a minor injury kept him in the bullpen. But when he did pitch, it wasn't until the eighth inning and the East had the game handedly won, leading 8-1. to one. But it did not stop the black press from riding Page, even though he played only two innings of mop-up duty, stating that Satchel Page gives the crowd a thrill. Gone were the burning articles from Gus Greenlee, and Page seemed to enjoy his redemption story and would never again walk walk out on a Negro League contract. With times changing, Cumberland Posey knew that the blackness of the game was more important than ever. So the league began to hire former players as umpire. Posey even moved closer to AFA on the issue of white booking agents. In December 1941, Posey sent a letter to AFA looking for ways to schedule dates at Yankee Stadium without Ed Gottlieb, assuring her that league president Tom Wilson would go along with what the rest of the league wanted to do. But by the end of 1941 season, the feud between the two was almost mostly over due to the events on the morning of Pearl Harbor. The attack on Pearl Harbor had huge ramifications for the Negro League, but even before Pearl Harbor, the gathering of the war effort aided by the Selective Service Act and African Americans enlisted, enlisted in large numbers, and the Negro League was well represented. Max Manning, Monty Irving, Lone Day, and outfitter Larry Dodd, Connie Johnson and Willard Brown all enlisted in the military. The white major leagues were almost debilitated by the war. President Franklin Roosevelt directed the game to continue and to be played in the best interest of the nation, but they would have to do that without any of its elite players. Compelled by public opinion to enlist in the service so as not to flaunt their privilege and class. So Joe DiMaggio, Ted Williams, Bob Lemon, Johnny Mize, and Eno Slaughter all future Hall of Famers and all missed the next three seasons, giving the very recognizable state of the major leagues and with black Americans increased opportunities during the war with millions of African Americans workers in defense plants and they packed into league games in almost every city. The large black turnout during the war for the Negro Leagues changed the fortunes for Page. Since he was the main attraction in 1942 East West game, Page got his usual cut from the gate but now he wanted it in advance. J.L. Wilkerson had begun a chartering a DC-3 airplane to ferry Page to and from his games, a luxury enjoyed by no other player. Wilkerson didn't want to ask the two league president to take out an advance for Page, so he gave Page $800 out of his own money. Given Page's status, he was sought out for comment by the white press on the issue of league integration. Page implied at the time that conditions weren't right for a mandate at the end of the color line. So he was worried that playing not only in the South, but in the North where they couldn't even stay or eat at some of the same places as the rest of the team. He stated that all the nice statements in the world from both sides aren't going to knock out Jim Crow. Page also had his own personal agenda. His income would drop if he joined the majors and he wasn't the best spokesman for the black game in terms of integration and his remarks supported the rationalizations of many white obstructionists in the major leagues. By 1942, the Negro Leagues were moving at a very slow, deliberate pace towards integration, stating that Negro League owners had a very hard time building up Negro baseball into a paying business, and we're going to continue to build it up. If we get our clubs so they can play for a real world championship, we will play it. If the, some of the white major leagues want our players, we will sell them. We have a business, and we're going to attempt to protect it in the same way as every other Negro or white businessman. 
In the meantime, we will advise our Negro players to do it all within their power to approve their playing. So if there's a chance for them to join the major leagues, they will be ready. The Major League official position in 1942 by Commissioner Kennesaw Mountain Landis was that there was no rule, formal or informal, no understanding, subterranean or otherwise, against the hiring of Negro players. This comment was big news for the black press and the Afro headline read, Landis clears way for owners to hire colors. While the courier wrote that was the judge jiving, stating that in his record in the past, the Major Leagues didn't support Landis's claim. Black civil rights leaders were allowed to address the owners at the major leagues meeting and offer proposals to advance integration and Landis ignored the pleas of several major league owners to debate the issue. It was it seemed to be a lip service from the major leagues and by the end of the year optimism from the black press had almost collapsed. It seemed despite the efforts of the black press, the white major league owners wanted to wait out the war and welcome their stars back in a still segregated game. Most of the white players and owners may have not been outwardly racist, but they didn't seek to change or upset the system either. Owners in the South could have used the economic advantages of having a ball club in small southern towns to force change by threatening to walk away and even in northern cities with the same economic advantages, but they told themselves that their investment in these local cities would would have been diluted by having black players and black attendees and devaluing the field and scaring away white fans who feel their stands regularly. Baseball wanted to impose rules even in the minor leagues fearful that farm teams might turn out to be proving grounds for integration. In 1941, a Western League promoter by E. Lee Kaiser made a deal with Satchel Paige to play for a white minor league team, but the deal was rescinded reportedly when the news reached Kennesaw Landis. Meanwhile, the Negro Leagues kept chugging along, offering some of the best baseball in the world. At a time, the Negro Leagues owners knew that real success required them to bring back their players from Mexico. The Mantleys turned to the courts to try to reacquire their players from other leagues with mixed results. When shortstop Lenny Pearson quit to join Dandridge Wells and Lynn Day in Mexico in the 1941 season, AFA hired an attorney, Richard E. Carey. Carey went to the State Department to hold Pearson's passport, claiming fraud since Pearson had been given an advance on his salary. Pearson decided against going to Mexico after all. Following year, he was close to leaving again for Mexico. Carey wrote to the draft boards, attempting to have his military status upgraded to 1A, which meant that he was available for military service. Pearson once again stayed. When she attempted the draft board strategy, with Ray Dandridge, not only did Dandridge refuse to comply with the threat, and AFA was forced to back down when Major P.E. Schwimm said that there was no action that could be taken against the ball players because they were an essential industry. In 1941, Gibson was also shameless about contracts like Page and quit the Homestead Grace only a few days after signing a contract to only to sign for a $800 offer for the Cuban Mexican Vera, for the Cuban Mexican Vera Cruz team. Cumberland Posey with Blast Page in the Black Press stating that we are the fall guy once more. We were in 1932 when Gibson signed a contract with the Grays and then used that contract to get more money out of the Pittsburgh Crawfords. Posey would sue Gibson for any loss that the Grays occurred for his leaving, claiming that damages around $10,000 and that Posey asked the court to reward him the deed to Gibson's home in the Hill District. Gibson led the Veracruz team to the Mexican Championship and he was named the league's MVP. Gibson would tell Posey that he would return to the Grays in 1942 and Cumberland Posey would drop the lawsuit and pay Gibson a satchel page like salary of $1,500 a month. What Posey didn't know is that Gibson came back home mostly because of his declining health. During his discursion to Mexico, it took a toll on him. He was already a heavy drinker, and him and Veracruz teammate Sam Bankhead openly guzzled case after case of Casa Verde in the dugout during and between games. Although Booz would not stop him on the field, while he was in Mexico, he began to toy with a more powerful high in heroin. The turning point for Gibson was the ending of his relationship with his common law wife, Hattie Gibson. She kept his self abuse tendencies from lurching out of control, but when they separated in the early 40s, Gibson began a relationship with Grace Fontier, who was the 
opposite of Hattie Gibson. She was a heavy drinker and known narcotics user. During games, she would sit in the stands, chain smoking and shivering on the hottest days. Now tired all the time and complaining that he was feeling ill, people around the grave said that Gibson looked nervous and depressed all the time and he seemed to be in a daze or a stupor. The now lean hard Gibson was a fat man around 225 pounds but it seemed to be all belly. His new weight made him hard for him to catch while squatting behind the plate and Gibson Get up again. So he began catching while standing in a slight crotch, bending at the knees. Posey and manager Vic Harris became alarmed at this behavior, and Harris even once found Gibson drinking beers in the bullpen during games. But because it was Josh, Harris simply kept Josh out of the lineup when he was too drunk to keep him from hurting himself. The next day, Josh would clear his head, and everyone would act like nothing would happen. Still, Gibson hit 323 in league games, and in 1942, he hit a league high. 11 home runs in 40 games. Page and the Kansas City Monarchs won the Colored World Championship in 1943, with Page feeling like black baseball was at his whim. So prior to the 1944 East-West game, to remove any leverage the players had, the owners added a new rule removing voter power from the East-West game from the fans and chose the participants themselves. The owners knew this was a risky move with black suffrage being a hot-button issue politically, but commissioners insisted this was to reward Aung Sung but the Deserving players, and they squashed any player dissent by arranging to play $200 per player, $300 per manager, and a pool of $300 per club to be split between the players not chosen for the East West game. The other players accepted these terms, but Page could no longer get his usual cut of the gate. Page attempted to lead a walkout in the 1944 East West game if all proceeds were not donated to the Army Navy Relief Fund. By this point, the event was so large that not even even Page could tarnish it. The East-West game outdrew the white major league all-star game in 1938, 1942, and 1943, and would do it again in 1946 and 47. In 1943, the game drew almost 46,000 fans, almost a quarter of them white. So Commissioner J.B. Martin calls Page's bluff and declared him ineligible for the 1944 game. While Page did win some sympathy from the black press, the East-West game went on without him and it marked the end in the Negro Leagues of Page as an icon. He remained as a part-time pitcher with the Kansas City Monarchs since most of the next several seasons and on the barnstorming trail and semi-pro teams that would offer substantial sums for two to three innings of work. Page avoided future East-West games out of spite, but his absence was missed less and less. The Negro Leagues rolled out the war years in style. Before the war, they operated with a law for seven straight seasons and team dues were rarely paid but in 1942 through 1945 each team cleared at least $25,000 in profits and J.L. Wilkinson routinely collected almost $100,000 in profit. In 1942 the league rang up almost $2 million in gate receipts but the game was changing once again. In 1944, Bill Vick Jr., son of former Chicago Cub president Bill Vick, tried to purchase the doormat Philadelphia Phillies. Vick put together a group of investors and made an attractive offer for the team and even came to an agreement with the team's owner, Jerry Nugent. However, the deal would fall through after Vec informed commissioner of the major leagues, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, of his intention to bring black ball players to the Phillies starting immediately. The day after the meeting with Landis, Vec learned that Jerry Nugent had sold the club to the National League and the league's president had awarded the franchise to Williams Cox, whose offer was half of Vec's. By the end of 1944 season, though, Kennesaw Mountain Landis had died from a heart attack and hope for desegregation of the major leagues was renewed. The new commissioner, A.B. Happy Chandler, come to prominence as the governor of Kentucky and upheld the state's policy of segregation in schools. But Chandler, in his new job, vowed to make integration happen in the major leagues. If a black boy can make it in Okinawa and Guadalcanal, hell, he can make it in baseball. 
The issue at the time was that Chandler had much less power than some of the powerful executives like New York Yankees president Larry McPhail, who regarded himself as the de facto commissioner and had veto power over the race issue. In March of 1945, the major leagues created an advisory panel, the Major League Committee to Baseball Integration. Its members included Philadelphia Court Magistrate Joseph Rainey, Afa Manley, and two white executives, Larry McPhail and Branch Rickey from the, from the Brooklyn Dodgers. Rickey was a savant and an odd by nature and once stated that the greatest untapped reservoir of raw material in the history of the game was the black race and the Negroes would make us winners from years to come. Ricky spoke much differently, but his actions weren't that much different than any other white executive. In 1945, when Joe Bostic, a sports editor for a black newspaper, showed up to Dodger Spring training in Bear Mountain, New York, with a pair of Negro players, pitcher Terrence McDuffie and Dave Thomas, for tryouts, Bostic stated that Ricky almost went berserk at being put on the spot. He finally allowed it, but, but it was cursed because both of the players were well past their primes and observers took the affair for the publicity stunt that it was. Meanwhile, the Major League Committee on Baseball Integration never even held a session, mostly because Larry McPhail was a rigid conservative and was stalling, but he was starting to feel the pressure of the race issue. He wrote the Commissioner of Baseball that they had a problem, but it wasn't a human rights issue. It was being put in a position to be forced to integrate Negroes into his ranks. He wrote that we can't stick our heads in the sand and ignore the problem. If we do, we will have colored players players in the minor leagues in 1945 and in the majors shortly thereafter. Early in the 1945 season, Ricky formed a team to play in the United States League, an all-black circuit being formed by black and white business owner in what was scheduled to begin in May. Ricky lent the Dodgers' name and a fraction of the club's resources to the league's Brooklyn Brown Dodgers, who would play at Epitz Field when the Major League Dodgers were on the road. Ricky was committed to the idea of speculating that the U.S. League might wiggle into or organized baseball structure someday, allow for its league's better players to find a way into the major leagues. The idea was no more than a scheme to try to clean up the Negro leagues by buying existing teams and creating a new league. White owners would recruit the black game's most promising talent, and the initial reaction to the new league was met with cynicism and even some anger from both sides of the divide. Black press was becoming increasingly militant about the issue and what it felt was an another Another attempt by white owners to gain profits from black players. White critics felt that this smacked of opportunism designed to play on the hopes and pockets of black fans in Brooklyn. It was believed that it was an attempt to gain fans loyalties in the Negro game at Yankee Stadium and bring them over to his own borough. Ricky also had to keep his racial initiatives a secret because baseball white executives took the idea of alienating its white fans and Southern players very seriously. No one knew at the time, but two years before in 1941, Ricky also began investigating the possibility of bringing black players to the Brooklyn Dodgers future. The decision was somehow made easier by the club's need to rebuild the team. Ricky obtained approval from the Dodgers owner and the team's board of executives to, to proceed with their covert plans. Everyone involved was warned to secrecy to not even tell their families, and Ricky only told a handful of office executives. As the search continued, Ricky narrowed down the list to Roy Campanella, pitcher Don Newcomb, and Kansas City Monarch shortstop Jackie Robinson. All three men had their background and character looked in extensively, and Ricky chose Robinson because he was the oldest and the least tainted by Negro League Baseball, with the temperament to walk through a minefield with a cool head and understand why he needed to do so. Robinson was scouted by Clyde Sucksworth, and Suckworth was a former Major League player and saw Robinson during the spring and summer of 1945 on Robinson's travels with the Monarchs. Finally, 
Finally, in August of 1945, Ricky advised Sucksworth to his biggest decision any baseball man would have made to date. He sent his scout to Chicago to meet up with Robinson before a Monarchs game, and Sucksworth told Robinson that Ricky wanted to make him a contract offer with the Dodgers, but that Ricky wanted to meet him first. All Robinson's life, he had lived within the constraints of his athletic abilities. Born in Georgia, but raised in Pasadena, California, Robinson spent two years at UC. UCLA in the early 40s and was the school's first four lettermen. He excelled at every sport from football to golf to swimming and his older brother Mac Robinson was also a great athlete. He was a member of the U.S. track and field team in 1936 in Berlin and placed second to Jesse Hoens in the 200 meter dash. But when he returned home, the only job that he was able to find was as a janitor. Jackie Robinson had similar issues after all his conquests at UCLA. LA, he had to drop out because he had to support his energy mother. An All-American back could be found playing for the Los Angeles Bulldogs, a semi-pro barnstorming football team. In 1942, Robinson was drafted into the U.S. Army and stationed in Fort Riley, Kansas. And Robinson was stunned that despite his education and his high intelligence scores, he was rejected entry into Officer Candidate School. Undeterred, he took his case to Joe Lewis, who was also stationed in Fort Riley, and within days, the War Department reversed the decision and Robinson earned the promotion to lieutenant. There was a large racial climate in Fort Riley. Black GIs could play football with white GIs, but they couldn't play baseball together. Robinson was asked to play for the camp football team, but he refused. And he was even ordered by the camp colonel, but he continued to protest because of the segregation of the baseball team. He was named the camp's morale officer over the black soldiers at the camp, and he attempted to decrease the seating on the black segregated section of the PX and got into a heated argument with a white officer who said he didn't want his wife sitting next to a nigger. Eventually, Robinson was transferred to Fort Hood, Texas. In Fort Hood, racism and Jim Crow blended together. Robinson got in major trouble with the bus driver outside of the camp when Robinson was asked to move to the back where the colors belong. He resisted and was arrested by the military police and brought up on court martial in July of 1944. Robinson defended himself stating that the army had recently prohibited segregation in its ranks and the charges were eventually dropped and Robinson was honorably discharged. These type of qualities impressed Branch Rickey far more than Robinson's play on the field with the Kansas City Monarchs. But Robinson was a competent infielder and hit 345 with five home runs and 13 stolen bases in 1945 and was the starting shortstop for the West in the East-West game. Robinson didn't allow himself to fit in with the mindset of the Negro Leagues and he isolated himself from his teammates and complained about the playing condition. He made it clear. He made it clear that the Negro Leagues were no more appropriate to him than playing for the Los Angeles Bulldogs had been. The loathsome feeling was mutual. The players tried to get close to Robinson but resented that J.L. Wilkerson attempted to replace Satchel Page at the draw with Jackie Robinson and placed him at shortstop replacing Jesse Williams who was an all-star at the position and probably the team's most popular player. But to Ricky, this alienation in the Negro Leagues was generally a good thing, and Robinson met Ricky in his office in August 28, 1945, in what became one of the most famous moments in sports history. Part of this legend was due to Jackie Robinson playing himself in the 1950 movie about his life, The Jackie Robinson Story. Ricky gets right up in Robinson's face, screaming at him with epithets that he would hear during the white game, and attempt to try to provoke him. Robinson would ask, Mr. Ricky, do you want a ball player who's afraid to fight back? Ricky posed the possibility that white players would come sliding into Robinson with spikes up and fists aimed at his cheek. And Robinson states, well, then I have another cheek. According to Clyde Sucksworth, the movie version was extremely accurate. For Robinson, the three-hour meeting was one of his finest moments, and he would later admit in his memoirs that Ricky's hard, unrelenting gaze made him feel almost naked. Robinson stood up to Ricky's barrage and clearly demonstrated upon encountering the inevitable act of racism that he would be able to keep a cool head. Ricky knew that he had picked the right man to integrate the major leagues with. Robinson's contract was mundane. It was $600 a month from the Montreal Royals with a $3,500 signing. 
bonus. It was 200 more than Robinson had made playing for the Kansas City Monarchs. But the money wasn't as important. There was a significant portion of the contract that had a stipulation that Robinson had no written or moral obligation to any other club, meaning that Robinson was free and clear of any liability he had with the Kansas City Monarchs, and he didn't owe the Kansas City Monarchs one penny of compensation, and neither did the Dodgers. By including this clause, it was a president that hurt the Negro League's ability to function as a commercial enterprise. After signing the contract, Ricky feared the worst and wanted player contracts for 1946 to be sent out and signed before the Jackie Robinson bomb exploded in Brooklyn. So for now, Robinson's isolation in the Negro Leagues proved to be an addition benefit because Jackie Robinson wasn't close enough to anyone to spill the secret. Ricky would carry on his interest in the U.S. League, but it was purely diversional. Ricky carried on the elaborate rules of the U.S. League and didn't scrimp on costs. He even hired New Negro League great Oscar Charleston to manage the Brooklyn Brown Dodgers and made certain to tout the team and the league in the New York press. But the entire time he was planning his out. Despite the glamour and the press attention that was assured because of Ricky's association with the league, the league began play in May of 1945 and was almost immediately in debt. Ricky stayed with the U.S. leagues in, into midsummer of 1945, nearing the closure of the Jackie Robinson deal, but withdrew an active role from the league, and it became obvious that the Brooklyn Brown Dodgers would not return in 1946, and the circuit would go out of business at the end of the 1946 season. Meanwhile, the secret of Jackie Robinson was doing quite well, and they would have been able to continue putting off the announcement had politicians not started using baseball integration as a campaigning issue. The Fair Employment and Practice Act was passed in New York State in 1945, followed by the Quinn Ives Act, which banned discrimination in hiring. The second statute empowered a committee to investigate violations of the law, and one of the committee's targets was Major League Baseball. At the same time, Mayor Ferrello LaGuardia made a grandstand play of his own with the formation of the Major Commission on Baseball. During an announcement, LaGuardia would state that baseball would shortly begin signing Negro players. Ricky didn't like the idea of political pressure and not his meticulous planning getting credit for the reason baseball was integrated, so Ricky changed his plans. In October 22nd, he told Robinson to catch a flight to Montreal the next day and Hector Racine of the International League's Montreal Royals made that fateful announcement that Jackie Robinson would be joining the Brooklyn organization. Now that the secret was out about the Robinson signing, press on both the black and the white papers reflected the general sentiment of the game. Meanwhile, the white papers barely reacted and many white Americans regarded this as being simply inevitable, but the black papers rang out with excitement. The Amsterdam News looked ahead and described this a drop of water in the rough to keep faith alive in American institutions. Branch Rickey even got his share of praise in the black press with the crisis nicknaming him John Brown of baseball. Others were not so sure of Ricky's motives and noted the timing of the Robinson announcement coming on the heels of the Mayor's Commission and the Quinn Ives Act. Some suggested that Ricky had been forced to act. This did not account for Larry McPhail's New York Yankees and allowed McPhail to posture against this claiming that he would not be pressured into this level of a vulgar publicity stunt. Many in the white press simply claimed that Robinson was not good enough to merit such attention. And Robinson went to Montreal. He was flooded by predictions of failure from numerous baseball experts, many who had not even seen him play on the field. Many Negro players shared their private evaluations of Robinson's qualifications. Buck Leonard admitted years later the feeling around the Negro Leagues was not kind. We thought that other players were better. And there was even some talk that Jackie Robinson had been chosen because he had the best chance of failing and it was staying all black players and stopping integration experiment. While Robinson was in the minor league, Branch Ricky signed four more Negro players in the spring of 1946 with a fraction of the fanfare of Robinson. Meanwhile, the Negro Leagues and the Major Leagues remained on their respective treadmill with no sense of change in the air. 
Tom Bard, co-owner of the Kansas City Monarchs, threatened to protest Commissioner Chandler and file suit against Ricky for signing away Jackie Robinson. He said that we won't take this lying down. Robinson signed a contract with us in 1946 and he, we feel that he is still our property. Ricky had his reasons for not purchasing Robinson's contract or even compensating the Kansas City Monarchs after the fact. Beyond his contempt for the Negro Leagues, Ricky knew that negotiation with the team would wreck his secrecy and he also could not see how Robinson's $400 a month handshake agreement constituted a standard baseball contract. Tom Bards faced criticism from the black press and in the face of these criticisms almost immediately took back the comments. J.L. Wilkinson felt compelled to state that he believed that the Dodgers owed them some kind of compensation. However, he would not protest Commissioner Chandler and he's very happy to see Jackie get a chance and I'm sure he will make good. In an effort to do something and protect their imagined rights, the black owners lodged a general grievance with Happy Chandler stressing that we are happy to see our players get an opportunity in the white major leagues we are simply protesting how it was done they asked ab chandler to rule that white owners deal with black owners instead of players directly the Negro League Commissioner Tom Wilson and J.B. Martin met with Chandler and petitioned for the old dream of black baseball to be recognized as either a major league or a minor league within baseball's organization. Chandler responded that he would be happy to extend recognition, but he said it will come when the game has a clean bill of health, as fair and honest, and clean from gamblers. At this moment, the black press no longer had a use for black baseball. Black baseball was in a can't-lose situation that was about to get worse when Cumberland Posey died in March 28, 1946. In 1945, his influence waning and his health failing while watching the black baseball disintegrate right before his eyes, he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And Tom Wilson was next. He was replaced as league president by Frank Forbes, who was loyal to Ed Godlip, and he sold his interest in the Baltimore elite giants to a black businessman, Richard Powell. And in May of 1947, he suffered a heart attack and died also. While the black press had disdain for Ed Godliff. Now the black press had no delusions that they could save black baseball from itself. And they believed the game would go, simply go extinct from social realities or internal pressures. But many hoped the league would be able to evolve into some type of minor league feeder or simply die out with some type of dignity and order. Even the East West game, which kept churning out profits for the owners, seemed to be an unflinching symbol of the Negro Leagues. In 1946, 45,000 showed up to Kaminsky Park to watch the East West game, but its only relevance now as an event was a showcase of talent for Major League Scouts. Virtually every player signed by the white Major League Baseball teams over the next half decade performed at one time or another in the East-West games. The Negro League players would come to view the East-West game not for its effect on black baseball, but for its effect on their chances to escape the Negro Leagues. As the Negro Leagues were declining, so was Josh Gibson's health. In 1942, he assumed they were hangovers, but in January 1st, he blacked out and fell into a six-hour coma. Doctors said that it was exhaustion and Gibson needed to rest. It was advice that he ignored and he went on to hit 552 in 1943, but in the following year in 1944, Gibson became noticeably drained, causing a loss of hitting power. Gone were the days of long home runs and he only hit 14 home runs over the next two seasons, but he still hit 393 in 1945 and many believed he was simply adjusting his game because of his age and his abusive lifestyle. Cumberland Posey's management hid the news of Gibson's obsession with alcohol and harder drugs, and because of this, Gibson faced almost no scrutiny from the black press. In 1946, though, when he blacked out, it was not due to exhaustion, but a brain tumor that doctors said was terminal. Not once did Gibson let on about his terminal illness, and when he was on the ball field, he was able to summon all his energies to give a passable imitation of his his old destructible self. In the fall and winter of the 1946 season, Gibson played in the Puerto Rican League and it would be his last as a ball player. One day he was arrested when he was found wandering naked in a daze on the streets of San Juan. He was, when he was released, he was sent home. 
suffering from headaches and dizzy spells and seizures. He seemed to be preparing himself for the end. He made a belated attempt to try to recover his old life that he had long since left behind. Gibson attempted to repair his relationship with Josh Jr., but Josh Jr. refused any financial help and the reproach failed. On January 20th, 1947, Josh Gibson died in what was called a stroke. Gibson's funeral was held in Macedonia Church and drew a few hundred mourners, and his death came as a great shock to many who knew him, and they realized that they didn't really know him at all. With the foundation of the Negro League stripped away because of Branch Rickey's signing of Jackie Robinson, the defection of fans from the Negro League games to the National League didn't immediately translate into mass signings of black players. With, with the white major leagues in 1948, only Branch Rickey and, and Bill Vett made integration moves with Roy Campanella to the Dodgers and Satchel Paige being called up to the Indians. Paige would become one of the hottest sports stories, drawing sellout crowds in the American League games. Satchel Paige promptly earned more respect for the Negro League games in one summer than several generations of black players had done in the Negro Leagues. The Indians would squeeze every drop out of the age gag out of Satchel Paige, implying that the 42-year-old was over 50. Meanwhile, the end was coming for the Negro Leagues. In 1948, the Newark Eagles moved to Houston, the Black Yankees folded, and the Homestead Grades went back to independent ball. After that, the Negro National League simply disbanded. Its 16-year run now over and 26 years after Rube Foster put together the league by the same name. Some teams would join the American League, but no longer had any delusion that black baseball would be changing the landscape of baseball itself. They were here to just run the very tip of baseball's tail. The Negro League's influence would continue to waste away and his following got smaller and smaller. The last All-Star game was held in 1962 and by 1966, the Indianapolis Clowns were the last Negro League team playing. The Clowns would continue playing exhibition games into the 1980s but it was more as a humorous sideshow like the Harlem Globetrotters than a competitive sport. In 1971, Satchel Paige was a unanimous choice as the first Negro League player elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame. Over the next five years, Cool Papa Bell, Judd Johnson, and Oscar Charleston were also all elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame. Page was state at his Hall of Fame speech, baseball has turned Page from a second-class citizen to a second-class immortal. Thank you. This is Country Boy. This has been One Mike. This has been the history of the Negro Leagues. If you enjoy this, you can find more black history on onemikeblackhistory.com. Also, consider donating to our Patreon page. Please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. And peace.